Audible, a fantastic, the, the number one, honestly, place to listen to incredibly well-made and narrated audiobooks for you. And I can listen to all of those fantastic stories via Audible, long car rides, gym, editing, making Warhammer figures, doesn't really matter. Audible is there and it is easy, affordable, and convenient. Of course, we had to ask for a Bricky's mom Audible recommendation. And once again, for the millionth time, she tells me, why haven't you listened to Project Hail Mary yet? It's like the best thing she's listened to in the last five years. And then my buddy Demeki is like, hey, Bricky, why haven't you listened to Project Project Hail Mary yet. So I guess we're gonna listen to Project Hail Mary. But if you want uh, the things that I am very versed in, well, we know, we know my hammers, there's war in them, they possibly have a 40K. And we are currently hopping into the Eisenhorn books, the famed Inquisitor Eisenhorn, the first one, Xenos, which is just rave reviews. As far as 40K books go, Eisenhorn has always been said to be one of the best when it comes to new people, introductions, story writing, mystery, and so forth. So if you want to save yourself some time and listen to fantastic audiobooks, go to audible.com slash Bricky or text Bricky to the number 500-500 to get started in listening to audiobooks today. Thank you very much for sponsoring this video, Audible. And let's talk about floors, two of them. You want to know how upsetting it is to have written the entire script, uh, filmed all the footage, recorded the, the entire video, uploaded it all to the computer, and then open up YouTube to see a Killing Floor 3 trailer? The pure coincidental humor that provided me was equal parts infuriating and exciting. Like, I was done with everything I needed to do on Killing Floor before I even knew of the trailer's existence. So, lucky me, I suppose. There has been a reinvigorated interest in Killing Floor and parallel to that, Killing Floor 2. Killing Floor 2. Killing Floor 2. Where, whew, where to start? Um, I'm going to assume you've watched the Killing Floor 1 video prior to this one. If you haven't, well, Killing Floor 2 came out in 2015 as Early Access and completed its release in November of 2016. The game's development was something I remember looking into quite closely. The first Killing Floor was a blast, and giving it more modern spin with a more modern budget was one of those dreams that only come true a handful of times. You know, the game promised new enemies, faster gameplay, better animations, more maps, characters, all that other stuff that a true sequel likes to come with. Did it deliver on these things? Yeah, but it's a little complicated. See, Killing Floor 2 as a sequel is great in a lot of ways, better than the original in a lot of ways. But with that came a monkey's paw that curled a few times in the making of this game and after it. Now you can look at this original and say to yourself, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a bit old, but goodness me, I sure do love it. But when you look at Killing Floor 2, it goes more like, it's a great game, just a few things you need to be informed about first. But let's start with the good first. Following the success of the original, the team had increased substantially to around 50 people in 2014. The sequel had a much higher budget, and this meant way more improvements to the fun parts of Killing Floor, aka bullets, blades, and blood. That was their main design philosophy. And for starters, Killing Floor 2 looks great. The visual design and colors of the game are way more realized in a great way. The art direction of the title was fleshed out a lot more, going for a more higher tech UI. You know, the individual parts of the heads up display are rounded and look a lot more digital. You know, they really enjoy their symbol usage too, and it just, it flows well. The old Killing Floor was a bit more grim, a bit more grimy. This new one almost feels like you're a, a high-tech mercenary there to kill all the Zeds you find and with that fun like black, red, and white color combination. Blood has actually been overhauled as the bloodstains left from killing Zeds will stay on the map indefinitely and during Zed time the game will go only black, white, and red. Plus, after that you have the new Trader Pod which has a much more sci-fi 
feel to it. And for the most part, the game's general art direction for the sequel, it's a lot more realized. You might prefer the grungier style of the first game, but I'd be surprised if you told me it wasn't a worked with what we had kind of situation. We're talking new budget, new people, new vision. It's definitely there. It also bleed bleeds uh, into how the enemies have been upgraded, both in their looks and how they die. There are a few new enemies in Killing Floor 2 and a few old enemies getting a bit of a facelift. The original clot enemy is still around, for example, but there are other variants of them in each game. So in reality, there are actually four main versions of the standard clot. The alpha clot, the cyst, the slasher, and the rioter. But in general, it's easier to classify each Z by its tier than by the individual differences. And by tier, I mean general size and strength. Like, lesser Zeds would be a tier, and it'd be the ones I just mentioned, as well as the Invisible Stalker, the Jumpy Crawler, and the Stabby Gorefast. There are also elite variants of them that come with higher difficulties. Uh, the Rioter, the Elite Crawler, and the Gore Fiends. Basically being armored clots, exploding crawlers, and high damage, high health Gorefasts. They also do this thing where, like, they hold up their blades to kind of, like, block their face so they don't get shot, you know? It's kind of neat. The medium Zeds consist of the bloat, the siren, and the husk from the previous game. There is a fourth edition, however, the EDAR, Elite Defense and Assault Robot. It's a weapons program gone horribly wrong, as they always tend to go, and are now equipped with all kinds of missiles, lasers, and other really annoying attacks. And finally, you've got the large Zeds, and these are mostly unchanged. The Scrake is still around, except he's been just really eating his protein. The Flesh Pound is still here to make your anus look like hamburger burger helper. And he also has a smaller, more spammable variant called the Quarter Pound, which is also known as a Royale Z in Paris. Oh, Quarter Pound with cheese. So you do have some new enemies to play around with in general, but almost more importantly, you have far more tools to deal with them as well. The game has a substantial increase in weaponry for every class, including a few new classes along the way. And it would take a significant amount of time to go through every single weapon that was added in this game, as well as all the DLC weapons that were added in the post-launch of the game. Newer rifles, new SMGs, new melee weapons, new explosives, new fire things, new, new everything. Each class has a plethora of new tools, and those new tools can actually be upgraded now too at the Trader Pod, which increases their stats and carrying weight by a block. It's, it's pretty good for a late game build once you got everything finalized. And I do need to make it clear though that some of these weapons completely jumped the shark. One of the newer classes that was added was called the Survivalist, kind of a combination of all the other classes mixed into one, but it in particular has some just insane weapons, like a locust firing grenade launcher that fires, shocker, locusts. Then one of the most insane guns I've ever seen, the, the Killer Watt, Killer Watt. A gigantic combination of machine gun and laser gun mixed into two that annihilates basically anything you pointed at. All right, I'm expecting greatness from this weapon, Jellicle. A few moments later. Holy shit! See, it always starts simple. It's the, the varmint rifle from the commando into a scar H into the mini gun into the HM Tech 501 grenade launcher. The support has a nice shotgun, then a combat shotgun, then an AA-12, then the doom stick, then the HRG blast brawlers. It jumps the shark multiple times in a row and you know, it can pull you out of the game a little bit. Like, even if the guns are fun to use, there's a bit of that more traditional firearm style that I hope it kept. The guns have actually been given some of the most attention to detail. They're actually rendered in a higher frame rate, so they fire better in Z time. But also, a lot of the animations, the reloads and stuff, were actually done by, I believe they hired actual soldiers to do it. And when you get perks that have you reload faster, it's not just a sped up version, it is a completely completely different animation for the reload. So in the early rounds, in the mid rounds, like having these kinds of firearms and sticking to it is great because a lot of effort's been put into these, but then you have the, the, the cock guzzler 45 HSP for 2000 bucks and I, it's a little iffy to me. It's heckler and cock. Though unlike my current sexual preferences, the new class system 
is very solid and isn't confusing in the slightest. See, instead of a massive tree of percentage upgrades, the new class system allows for a more customizable approach while maintaining some of their prior power. Let's say the Berserker, for instance, you know, big, big melee boy. In Killing Floor 1, there was just this, this laundry list of benefits and upgrades that you got, and you can just get even more ludicrous with time. This time, the benefits are simpler. For Berserker, it's 1% increased damage with perk weapons per level. Also, there is a 3% damage resistance for every five levels, as levels now go up to 25 instead of five or six, though they're much easier to level. Each perk now has a special skill you can unlock per each five levels. Two, in fact, you choose which of the two you want to be active at all times in the game. So for level five Berserker, you can either double your health or move faster, sprint faster, and regenerate your health. At level 10, you can either heal for each Zed killed and attack faster, or attack faster and do 20% more damage. This normally culminates to a special Z time specific bonus at level 25. In this case, it's either a 50% HP regen every time it activates or refreshes and immobilizing all nearby Zeds, or you move in completely real time during Z time while everyone else is going slow. So the amount of insanity is really not lost on Killing Floor 2, but it's a lot more fun insanity, customizable insanity. It's actually created in a neat way. Each level has a theme going for it across the classes. Level five is movement, 10 is basic technique, 15 is skill, 20 is equipment, and 25 is master technique, AKA the Z stuff. So while the Berserker has a movement option at level five, the sharpshooter has increased damage while stationary or shooting and movement speed bonuses when using perk weapons. At level 20, the equipment one, the sharpshooter has the option to carry more ammo or increase headshot damage with weapon iron sights, while the berserker ups their melee attack damage and knockback power. Since it's all intertwined in its own way, a theme that goes across the board, a Z time bonus at the end, and still small percentage increases along the way. A personal favorite of mine is the new SWAT perk, SWAT, you know, my beloved, which is all about being a one man army. Chunkier armor, higher magazine size, better Zed stunning power, and all kinds of other bonuses. Now, while I was a little more lukewarm on the new guns, I think this new perk system is absolutely awesome. There is more player customization, there is more player choice, and the differences are much more game impacting instead of enormous damage bonus number 48, which does tie into the game itself and how it's played. Now, there are a few more options that come with Killing Floor 2 and its game modes. You do have the same difficulties and the same hell on earth. You do have the various game lengths, and you still have the fun custom games too, including weekly game mode refreshes. But a personal favorite of mine was actually the new Endless Mode. You know, as, as a COD Zombies fanatic, having an endless mode is always a pleasure, especially because you gain XP for the class you're using. So having there be a reason to go as long as you can and still earn points is awesome. And the endless mode, surprisingly, doesn't end. <laughs> and mixes it up with all kinds of different modifiers and objectives throughout. Now you might need to go capture a point or all the enemies will have giant heads or they float up into the ceiling or maybe they spam a certain enemy at you. Now another addition, the endless mode is actually giving you a boss round every five rounds. A and look, that's our tasteless white boy again with the segue. Killing Floor 1 had one boss, the Patriarch. Killing Floor 2 launched with one boss also. Von Hans Schnitzel dies something or another, but then added in a bunch of new bosses with updates to the game. Five in total. A Dr. Hans Volter is a interesting, more lithe enemy that throws grenades, shoots you in the face, and gives you the big suck. I will say, uh, Hans dual wields assault rifles. I think they're like STG 44s or whatever from, from Germany back in World War II, which is just kind of funny. And if you're unprepared for them, they will rip it to you. When he hits a certain threshold also, he'll deploy a shield and then like rip into you a bit more personally. I actually like Hans a lot. He has a good damage and a good bit of urgency when you fight him. Uh, but on the other side of the spectrum, there's the Abomination, a gigantic fat joke rolled into one with him literally farting all over the map and hitting you with his gas. Also, his little wacky flailing arm dudes running at you with extreme speeds and their very bizarre sound effects. 
Like I said, the abomination though, despite his thickness, is really fucking fast. He just bulldozes you down, and while it makes him a simple fight, it also makes him an annoying fight that the game just loves to throw at me. All right, please anything but the abomination again, or I'm gonna shit myself. There's the King Flesh Pound, which is not a boss I have fought a ton. It's basically just a souped up Flesh Pound, better in rage, some spin moves, a shield, a gigantic laser out of his chest. Uh, the Patriarch did come back as well. He's about the, he's actually just about the same as before. He just looks different. Big minigun, rockets, cloaking, healing, the whole nine yards. He just looks different. But he also brought over his new main squeeze, the Matriarch, uh, who is a boss that was created by the worst people who have ever lived. She is a gigantic mech suit with two destroyable parts and a face guard. There is a huge cannon on one of her arms and a claw on the other. And what makes her so annoying is the just staggering amount of range damage she does to you and destroying her cannon arm will actually have her enraged and barrel down at you even faster. If her attacks, damage, and speed weren't bad enough though, her main helping force are the EDAR robots who also fire guns, missiles, and grappling lasers at you. She is awful and I hope she steps on Legos. Though endless mode with all of these bosses cycling through them, especially on the higher difficulties because suicidal and hell on earth are actually more souped up than before there are different enemy movement patterns, different enemy attacks and defenses. It's not just more numbers. There are effects. All that stuff is great and a ton of fun, a great breath into the higher difficulties for Killing Floor. Oh, and also, Killing Floor, you know, the maps. We got we got to talk about the maps, the new maps. They're good. They're pretty damn good. I like their look. They play with the lighting really well. I think that the enemy spawning is mostly solid, even though they can be a little bit of like a spawn from everywhere situation. A map on a giant airship, one on an oil rig. The variety is all there. There are some that I do miss from the first game, specifically West London and the Biolab, but even so, I have very little negative things to say on the maps. And I bet you think I forgot. You thought I wasn't going to talk about the music. You, how could you ever come into a Killing Floor 2 video and not expect me to talk about the soundtrack? How, how could you have such little faith in me? Such low faith in me? Ya boy! Play the soundtrack. Lastly, the game had some pretty great Christmas events. It almost felt like a modder made them, and I mean that in a good way. Like, the events were a little jank, but in that fun, hey guys, wouldn't it be super cool if we did this for Christmas? Like, that kind of jank way. Zed outfits, redone maps, that whole thing. Oh yeah, I forgot. Uh, modders are still hard at work. Uh, the most downloaded map for Killing Floor 2 is the Bikini Atoll map, which is just this giant fan fucking tastic rendition of Bikini Bottom. It's unironically my favorite map in the game. Genuinely, this modder outdid themselves. It's so good. Oi, SpongeBob, me boy. The Zeds have taken over my business and I'm overdosing on ketamine. <laughs> now, if you've noticed, so far in this video, I've been just positive. I have only made a couple negative comments here and there, wacky weapons, annoying bosses, that's about it. Because when it comes to the game and playing the game itself, all of it is stellar. And I genuinely believe to be a massive upgrade from the original game. And that's what happens when you have a, a bigger budget and a larger team that is hyper dedicated to their craft. So why did I sound so flaky when I first mentioned the game at the beginning of the video? Ar, 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 sponge boy me bob i'm charging way too much money for killing floor expansion packs three of the tabs are all based on microtransactions fuck you plankton ar, ar. <laughs> yeah it's there's so many of them everything outside the gameplay of the game everything outside the gameplay it is confusing overwhelming and a bit shite like killing floor one was no stranger to microtransactions, right? It had its fair share of new guns and things, but Killing Floor 2 is loaded with them, and the prices are quite high. This is also a game that came out in 2016 at the height of the loot box trend. Call of Duty, the, the year, I know what it is, 2016, Infinite Warfare, game
gaming also had loot boxes. See, it's not just loot boxes in Killing Floor 2, though. There's also crates that you earn and can only be opened with real money keys, much like in CSGO or TF2. And what really adds to it is the level of confusion I experience when going through these menus. There's the vault, which is you earning money in game to get new crates. And these are technically crates that don't cost anything or need keys, but then there are crates that do cost things and need keys. And if you don't want to buy keys, you can dismantle them for a currency that allows you to craft new items. But this currency isn't across the board. There is cosmetic character currency and weapon currency, but it's not just a regular currency. There are four types of currency for each, all in different rarities. So there are in fact eight different specific currencies. You need to craft a cosmetic or weapon skin that you don't even know what you're getting. Not to mention, you need 10 to craft one random thing. And I only got one regular uncommon currency per crate I dismantled. Then there are the actual skins in the game and their price points. And some just feel so overblown. And then some feel quite the opposite. Like there's no rhyme or reason to it at all. There are weapons that are purchasable in the game, actual weapons, which can be considered pay to win a bit. You know, it's a co-op shooter, a bit of a gray area there. But even so, these weapons can be bought and often come with a ton of skins too. For example, there is the G36C rifle and blood sickle weapons that both come with five different skins for those two weapons for $15. Two weapons for specific classes because they, they both have five skins each, but you can only use a skin on a weapon one at a time, you know? What if I only like one of those five skins? I gotta buy the whole thing? Then there's like the Reducto Ray weapon, which is the gun and five skins for the gun for 10 bucks. Then there are character cosmetics, which is a whole new outfit and multiple skin colors, often six of them for five dollars which isn't awful but your character outfits are for characters in a first person shooter where you don't see your character then good God, there are massive crate packs for 30 bucks with the crates and the keys that go with them. Emotes that are at best really mid and also don't seem to have a feature to let you preview what they are on the purchase screen. There are headshot special effects bundles like grunt birthday party style things. Then there is an entire market for the game too, a full on market system like CSGO, like TF2 that allows you to buy and bid on various other cosmetics that you cannot purchase outright for the game. It's like someone looked up the word microtransaction, chewed it up, swallowed it, and vomited it back up into a video game. It is astounding how confusing, overly complicated, and ridiculous everything about this is, from the prices to the things you buy. This all coming from a $30 game. I said Killing Floor 1 was a bit pricey at $20, 2 at $30 isn't that bad actually, but it feels so much worse with all this shit crammed in it. And then you get to the optimization of the game. I have a ridiculously strong computer. A lot of streamers run two PCs, one to play the game and the other to stream it. Now, I'm not very good when it comes to software and troubleshooting. And I'm the kind of guy who tries the same fix over and over five times, wondering why it isn't working. And then I just start crying. So to remedy that, I just have one big beast PC to do it all. Play, record, stream, sometimes record with two applications at the same time, depending on the content I need to make. I get stutters and frame lag for this game when I play for fun, without recording it, without streaming it, on this 2016 game. Not often, mind you. From the footage you see in the background, it probably looks pretty smooth, but even I still get some things. But as I so often need to say, works on my machine is not a real argument. For so many others outside of me, this game has constant amount of crashes, stutters, lag, and everything in between. For a a lot of people, once Windows 11 came out, the game couldn't even run. It genuinely would load up and hard crash every single time. If you look at the Steam reviews, there's a lot of positives going on. You know, the game is very positive. Like, a lot of good that I've already mentioned, all the gameplay stuff. But the longer you scroll down, the more you'll find people having technical issues, lamenting the addition of weapons behind a paywall. And then there's the whole CEO thing, which I really don't want to get into. It's why my review is great game, but, as opposed to the first title. The first title is old, it has some charm, a few issues, but for the most part, it's a lovely time. This game 
plays better, feels better, looks better, sounds better, and I'd honestly say is better than the original in every way that is gameplay. But it has the stinking odor around it that is this confusing, egregious microtransaction and horrible optimization problem that just seems to be random. You might have zero problems, you might not even be able to launch it. And I want to touch on the microtransaction thing a little bit. This might be a little controversial, but it's just something that I've seen in my experience after talking to some people. A $60 game, you know, one and done, is only feasible for a couple of studios. The ones that are extremely large and sell tons of copies. A Jedi Survivor, a $60 game, crap, a $70 game, my apologies, I forgot we're there now. God of War. Elden Ring, these kinds of games can do that because they're huge studios with tons of backing behind them. And more specifically, they sell enormous volumes of copies. Smaller studios of only maybe three to five people, three to 10 people can also get away with that at a quick low cost release. A Battle Bit Remastered for 15 bucks done by three people, Hollow Knight for 15 bucks done by three people. But unless you're Super Giant Games, for example, you know, the middle of the pack double A studio, there's a good chance you're going to need some kind of recurring income. A Deep Rock Galactic is a good example. It's not too expensive and none of the new content costs anything, but there are tons of opportunities to spend money that keeps the studio going. Killing Floor and in extension Tripwire are completely in their right to put microtransactions in their game. That's the, the controversial part is I don't actually think microtransactions are innately a bad thing. I'm happy when they're not in certain games, but for the most part, it's been done pretty elegantly in the past by a lot of studios. And for a lot of those studios, these microtransactions are what keeps things going. And not just the lights on. Like, I don't think it's fair for us to ask them to only break even. Now, I think it's totally fine that if they want to add this so they can make a profit, like they're a company, you know, they made a great game. I want them to be paid. It's why I tip my artists when I commission stuff. You know, I want them to do more than just survive. The problem is very often the common dev does not see that money. I'm sure the developers at Activision Blizzard definitely got a cut of that, uh, what was it, $6 billion in microtransaction revenue? Oh, I'm positive. So when I say that Killing Floor 2 has horrible, egregious microtransactions, it isn't because they, they exist. I don't mind if they exist. Recurring revenue is important for a ton of studios right now, but it's because the transactions swim in, in this terrible tube of overpriced crap on one side, in-game power on the other side, community market prices on top, and loot boxes on the bottom. If this whole thing was just cut down to a classic case of earn premium currency by playing or buy the new stuff Deep Rock Galactic style? Rock and Stone! Like, nobody would be upset that you want more money. I'm fine with giving you more money, but not for this shit! And not for how you're selling it to me! If Team Cherry said, hey guys, we need a bit more money for Silk Song, and also an expensive bottle of wine for the team to celebrate its release. We have added a skin for the knight in the Hollow Knight game that makes his mask red, not white. It's one dollar. Thanks. I'd buy that shit and not even bat an eye, because I like those devs. I trust them. I believe in their product. I like the Killing Floor devs. I like their game, but I do not trust this was the right call. It is a Astounding the amount of money people will pay to the right people, to the right group, to the right community, to people who respect their time, respect their decisions, respect their wallets. I know people who play Deep Rock Galactic all the time. They spend tons of money on those microtransactions and they don't play it nearly as much as a ton of other games, but they really like Deep Rock. I know it's a bit of a ramble, a bit scatterbrained, I know, but I'm, I'm trying to make my point that like, in this day and age in 2023, microtransactions are a thing that if you don't put them in your game, cool. But if they're in your game, I, like, I get it. Just so long as you respect me, you respect my time and you respect my wallet. And Killing Floor 2, is not doing that. Whew. 
hopefully that I made my point across. That was a, a bit, I could have explained that probably a little bit better, but I hope I made it clear. Killing Floor 2 is a bizarre project. It is obviously something made with a ton of love and skill. The developers clearly love the title they're working on. It has all the hallmarks of real passion and real creativity fleshed out in a fun, if simple, original title. I don't know where all the microtransaction parts went wrong, but for the developers themselves, the people who put all that work, the art teams, all of them, they made a fantastic game game. I think this game can be recommended at the end of the day to solo players more than the first one, but specifically, of course, to groups. That being said, it's just a game that you need to be warned about with its excessive transactions and the possibility that it might run poorly on your machine. Steam still has their lovely two hour full refund policy, so you can find out for yourself if you'd like. Personally, I think the game is too good and too fun not to recommend it. Just know the giant asterisk above my recommendation. Whew, that was a long one. I've got scatterbrained on a lot of those topics, I'm sorry. The microtransaction thing is, is a weird one. I, after speaking to a, a lot more devs in the past, like, three years of doing this kind of content, I've learned a lot about the industry. I, I'm playing Armored Core right now, probably will give me the next video. Amazing game. Love the fact that $60 and you're done, that's all you spend. Love that, but it's from soft, you know, they, they can do that kind of thing. Thank you so much for watching. It was a pleasure having you all here. If you wanna buy some merch, my beloved, you can get it at the store right here, right now, orchidate.com, link in the description. Check out the Bricky tab, it's under the content creators part. Concrete creators, i.e. concrete. I'll see you next time. Come on, obviously you're a skater.